All right, welcome to welcome to principles and strategies for church revitalization. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, some lectures for today, but uh, this is week one of our class, and um, I'm glad to have you in this uh, doctoral class uh, this semester. Uh, let me first introduce you to myself. If you're not familiar. Uh, with me, or we haven't had a class together yet. Um, uh, this is my wife, Allison, and I. We've been married for a little over 15 years, and we have five children together. Isaac's 12, Noah is 10, David is 8, Leah's 4, and Anna is 2. It's really helpful when they're all on an even set of years like that, uh, so that I can kind of keep track. But uh, 12, 10, 8, 4, and 2. Um, so busy, very busy household, but a lot of fun. The boys are into basketball right now and, um, have just played, my two oldest have just played their first season of, uh, middle school, uh, basketball. Of course, Upward is a big ministry here, um, at the church where I serve as the lead pastor here at Lebanon Baptist Church in Greensboro. And uh, they, they've been playing Upward, uh, Isaac for five years, Noah, I think has been playing for four and David's been playing for the last three and so we just finished up Saturday our upward season for this year, and so a lot of a lot of basketball involved right now. Still, uh, just uh, the tournament left for upward for the middle school boys that Isaac is playing in. But anyway, uh, this is our family. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my educational background. Uh, I completed my Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts um, both in Biblical Studies uh, from Piedmont, um, now Carolina. Um, but this is within Piedmont Divinity School. Back at the time, uh, we were called Piedmont Baptist College and Graduate School, and so um, did my undergrad in biblical studies, and then went on and completed a master's, finished those in 07 and 09. Uh, then I went on and completed a Master of Arts in Christian Leadership from Liberty University in 2013, and most recently completed my Doctor of Ministry degree from Dallas Theological Seminary in 2020. And that degree uh, was focused on church health, leadership, and multiplication. Um, so the D-Men project title that um, I uh, chose for, um, for my uh, Doctor of Ministry degree project was Selected Case Studies in What Revitalized Churches Identify as the Most Critical Components for Revitalizing an Established Church to Be a Healthy, Growing, Multi-Generational Church in the 21st Century. Uh, so a few things uh, kind of specific to that. Uh, one, uh, I chose a case study research approach, so I wanted to look at other uh, churches that fit certain criteria. I had to clarify and narrow in the criteria that would make a, a church viable for my study, and then I had to narrow down which churches I would pick. And Actually, I picked three uh, churches. One uh, church is down near the Charlotte area, about an hour and a half uh, from here. Another one is just 15, 20 minutes uh, from here, um, and then um, uh, the last one I, I chose was in Florida, and so I thought, eh, let me find a, a good church that fits my criteria in West Florida, and so, uh, but no, specifically, I uh, was looking at um, West Bradenton Baptist Church, which is where Sam Rayner, uh, who is the author of uh, uh, some of the books that appear on your bibliography, uh, Sam pastors that church, and so I wanted to go and see uh, kind of what had happened there. And I was looking specifically at uh, established churches. So that that for me meant it had to at least be 40 years uh, of age. The church itself had to at least be 40 years of age. I think all of the ones that I studied were either 65 uh, to even like 150 years old. But they're established, been around for a while, uh, uh, long enough. The 40-year thing is long enough to where uh, you, you've got basically some uh, older adults in the church that uh, were there from the very beginning, uh, the inception, and that kind of formalizes and, and makes it an established church. And then I wanted to see kind of what, what were the components that led uh, to that church growing. And so I thought I knew what I would find, and based upon all the reading and research and study I'd been doing for the degree, I uh, proposed uh, some components that I thought would be found to be true in these churches where also a new pastor had come in, and prior to that pastor coming, the church had either plateaued or declined, and then 
during the new pastor coming in and over the next uh, five years or more, there was sustained, continued growth. And so, uh, and also that the church would be multi-generational, not just a church where you have all, uh, say, all millennials or you have, say, all um, baby boomers or, or silence or no, there's you, you would have multi parents, kids, grandparents, even great grandparents, multi generational makeup of the church. And so uh, I was studying that because I had uh, just come uh, to be the pastor here at Lebanon Baptist in 2017. And so I wanted to kind of see this was a church that had declined um, and uh, had been plateaued. And so what does it look like? And so I kind of had some components I thought I would find. And then I went and tested that based upon the cases, did the research and came back with some conclusions uh, that I present. All of that's in there. If you're interested in in reading some of that or just seeing it as an example, I can certainly uh, send it to you. If you'll email me and request it, I can provide it for you. Um, But uh, some of the things I thought I would find to be true, I did. Uh, some of the things I did not necessarily um, expect, um, I found, and then some things I think I was just a, you know just overlooking emerged, and then some things that I thought I would find I didn't find as prevalent as I expected. So there's a lot that kind of went into that, um, but you, all of that gets uh, presented in chapter five of of my uh, demon project. But if you're interested, let me know and I'll send it to you. Uh, my ministry experience, I've been in full-time pastoral ministry since 2007. Um, lead pastor here at Lebanon Baptist in Greensboro since 2017. Prior to coming here, I served for eight and a half years as a youth uh, and then associate pastor um, at another church here in Greensboro before coming here to Lebanon. And then I've also been teaching as an adjunct professor at Piedmont Uh, since 2013. Uh, Here's where we're going in this course. Um, I want this course to be extremely practical, um, and and so I want it to really be helpful and uh, valuable for, uh, especially for those pastoring or serving in a pastoral role, whether you're lead pastor or whether you're another pastor on staff, but I want this to be highly practical uh, for you and to help you in your ministry. Uh, what we'll be doing this first week and and probably even into week two is uh, dealing with the topics of assessing the church and evaluating their readiness for change. Uh, then we will go into uh, stage one and stages two and three of revitalization, that is the preparation uh, for it, and then the process and the practice. And then we'll look specifically in week four at the roles of prayer and preaching in revitalization, and then we'll analyze eight systems of a healthy church and Then the last two weeks, we'll focus on the traits and behaviors of a revitalization uh, or re-envisioning pastor. Um, Some of those are kind of uh, just wirings that are maybe sort of part of your divine design that is helpful for you to learn and to understand about yourself. But what does it take uh, to be a pastor that leads a revitalization effort? Um, but I want to just encourage you that uh, there are behaviors that are a part of this, and behaviors can be learned. And so just because uh, a pastor uh, doesn't necessarily fit an exact mold when it comes to uh, his wiring or divine design, if you will, doesn't mean that there aren't behaviors that he can learn that will really help him in the process of becoming uh, a better um uh, revitalization pastor, because I, I am convinced that uh, you can learn these things uh, and that pastors can grow in these areas uh, to lead revitalization in the church. I, I don't believe uh, any healthy church is ever, or any, I don't believe any church is ever led uh, to be revitalized unless the pastor himself is being revitalized. And so as we are experiencing revival really, is we are experiencing revival in our heart and life as the pastor, uh, that can translate into um, revitalization in the church as well. Uh, I do think you see pastors sometimes who experience revitalization who do not lead that. They experience it personally, but they don't lead their church to that. That happens sometimes. But rarely, if ever, do you find a church 
being led to be revitalized where the pastor isn't experiencing that revitalization in his own heart and life. So we'll look at some of that in the last couple of weeks in the course. Okay, um, for now, let's deal with assessing the church and evaluating their readiness for change. And if you are in an established church, uh, you probably immediately kind of clenched when you read the word change. <laughs> because as the old joke goes, how many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is change. Why would we ever want to do that? Um, yeah, it, it is a kind of a, a, a funny thing with Baptists that we struggle with change. I oftentimes make, uh, make jokes with our church to try to lighten the mood around some of those things. I'll get up and say, Hey, um, you know, we're going to uh, do something a bit different today. Up, oh, up, oh, you know, don't everybody get too upset. I know we're Baptists, but, uh, we're going to do something a little unusual today or different. Um, you know, that, that, that sometimes can soften the blow a bit, but, uh, if, if a church, the, the point is really in this regard, if a church is plateaued or declining, uh, there is a strong chance, a uh, very likely chance that the church needs to change. Um, if we're talking about a church in need of revitalization, we're talking about a church that needs to change. Um, sometimes you'll find churches that maybe situated in a community where the community is, you know, the population and community around it is declining and the church is, you know, maybe not growing. And that's one thing. But most of the time when we find churches that are plateaued or declining, we find them in communities that are actually growing. And so in that case, when there are people and lost people moving into a community, but the church is not growing, then something does need to change. So how do we know if a church is ready to change? How do we know what needs to change? Where do we begin uh, in our assessment process? You know, it has been said, uh, very, very well said, uh, that uh, prognosis without diagnosis uh, is malpractice. Prognosis without diagnosis is malpractice. Uh, and so as a pastor to come into a church and to simply, um, uh, you know, give a prognosis, here's what we need to do now without diagnosing the problem, uh, th th that's malpractice. And so how do we avoid that? Well, we assess. We take a little time and we evaluate and we explore what really is going on in this church that needs to change. You may come and say, well, you know, what needs to change is we need to reach lost people with the gospel. Okay, well, let's look at that. Or is the church experiencing any uh, salvations or baptisms? You know, are there, are there members in the church sharing the gospel or not? How do we, how do we know what aspect uh, related to that needs our, uh, our attention? Uh, so uh, let's look at it. Uh, a few more statistics. Uh, statistics indicate that 87% of Protestant congregations in America are plateaued or declining. The average church in America has 87 people. 85% of all churches in America average less than 200 in worship attendance any given Sunday. Now, the fact that there are a lot of churches that average less than 200 is not, that's not bad. Um, the fact that the average church in America averages 87 people is not bad. That's not bad. Now, the first statistic is that's the one that's difficult, uh, that's troubling, that they're not growing, that they're either plateaued or they're declining. And the vast majority of these are in communities that are actually growing. Um, the other numbers here just simply speak to the fact that there's room. There are room for most churches to grow, just from looking at the uh, number of people there. Again, uh, numbers do not, the, the total number in worship attendance does not tell the whole story. Sometimes we have a tendency to look 
at a church of 2,000, and we may think, oh, that church is doing it right. They're doing it well. And we may look at a church of 250 and go, eh, they're not doing as well as that church. And maybe they're in the same city. But the number doesn't of attendance doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was up in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, for a uh, SEND network um, a church planter training. Uh, as the sending church pastor, I was there with a couple from our church that we are uh, working with right now uh, to send out to go plant a church. They really have a heart um, to move their family from Greensboro up to Baltimore. Now, it just happens to be that the training was happening there because that's where they uh, do that region uh, of training uh, for the whole East Coast. But there were about a dozen uh, couples there that were being sent out from different churches to go around the the kind of east, uh, northeast uh, sort of region to plant churches. Well, I was up there with one of the families from our church that have a heart to go to Baltimore. And so one of the pastors that uh, we were in a meeting with, uh, their church is about 20 years old. They run about 250 people. And um, over those last 20 years, though, get this, they have planted uh, 20 churches out of their church. Almost a church every year has been sent out where they're sending people out. And so there's a multiplication effort there. In fact, over the last 20 years, this church of 250 people right now, uh, this church has not only planted churches, but they have planted churches that have planted churches that have planted churches. So they actually have not only grand child churches, but great-grandchild churches within this multiplication planting movement from this, what may seem to be sort of a, a median, above average, a little bit above average, but not a large church, not a mega church, but we would look at this church of 250 and say, well, you know, they're okay, they're, they're, they're doing all right. We might look at a larger church and think that they're doing better. When the larger church may not have planted any, and this church has planted several thousands uh, that would be a part of that church now over their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and the multiplication effort that has gone into that. So these numbers do not say big church good, little church bad. You know, it's all about multiplication and looking at the health of uh, the church. Uh, again, here's just a few more statistics, uh, just so you see a little bit. Uh, in this, you ought to see the vast majority of pastors and the vast majority of people in the U.S. are attending uh, churches that are less than uh, 250. In fact, um, when you get up over 1,000, uh, it's only about 1.5%. One 1.5 out of every 100 pastors, only about 1.5 preach to churches of 1,000 or more on any given Sunday. Another church that I'm very familiar with um, that's larger, that's in that group, uh, running about twelve to 1,300, for the last 10 years, they've never grown beyond that point. Uh, they have planted, they have planted one church uh, out of their church, but over the last 10 years, they remain around 12 to 1,300 in worship attendance. Uh, new members joining, sometimes between 75 to 100 new members joining every year. But the church is not uh, growing. It is plateaued. And so just because a church has a large number of people coming doesn't mean necessarily that the church is healthy. And a church can be healthy in one respect and not healthy in another. And so that's why you have to look at all the different aspects. Here's what we're going to deal with in this uh, lecture. We're going to look at the health and consider the need in these different areas. Outreach, evangelism, assimilation, community analysis, prayer, preaching, finance, facilities, and leadership. If I was coming into a church to do consulting or was being called to be the pastor, or I was pastoring the church, or I was being considered to be the pastor, these would be the areas I would want to take a peek at, uh, to look at, to see where the, the needs of the church are and what the health of the church is in each area. So here are a few questions that um, 
could be asked when it comes to uh, and relates to the issue of outreach and to that particular uh, subject. Um, so what programs or ministries does the church offer to help connect its members with lost people in the community? Uh, what are you doing? What, what is the church doing uh, to help uh, bridge the gap there? What are we doing to build bridges that connect the community to the church? Is Sunday morning a safe place to bring lost people? Uh, what about the sermon? Does it regularly assume lost people are present? Now, those two are a little different from the first two. Let me talk about the first two to begin with. What is the church doing other than meeting on Sunday and putting a sign out that tells the community what time they meet? What are you doing other than that to help connect your members with lost people in the community? Sometimes we do events on our church campus that can provide that opportunity. Other times you may be trying to teach and train and equip your people to do things in their neighborhoods that will help do this. But the way I would like to kind of summarize it is, do, um, do your people and does the church help equip and provide opportunities for your people to come into meaningful contact, meaningful contact with lost people in the community? So uh, a couple of things that we do. Uh, we do have a food pantry ministry here at our church where once a month um, from like 9 a.m. to 12 on a Saturday morning, people can come through and go through our food pantry and they're given uh, prepackaged amounts of food based upon their family size. And ours is literally just a drive through. So they wait in the parking lot in line and then they drive through and they're given that uh, food. It meets a need in our community. While they're here on our campus, we go around and, and pray with them. We give them a different track. Uh, just about uh, every couple of months, we have a different track that we use. We usually have between 90 to 170 families. 90 to 170 families come through uh, every single month. And there is some meaningful opportunity for engagement with them while they're here, waiting in line, parked, trying to get through to get their food, where we can meet them, talk to them, ask them questions, pray with them, and even give the gospel to them in a track form. Another ministry that we do here that's really big at our church is uh, is Upward Sports. Um, Upward Sports is by far our most impactful strategic outreach ministry. We, as I mentioned earlier, we just finished up Upward Basketball and Cheerleading this year. We had about 500 kids in our upward basketball and cheerleading uh, ministry this season. And so there's meaningful contact there because you have coaches, you're dealing with the players and the kids and the parents and the families. They're coming onto our campus for an hour every week for practice, plus another hour on Saturdays for games. Now, if they have multiple kids, they're here on our campus, you know, two hours, four hours, six, eight hours. They're, they're here a lot during the week. And for us, of those 500 kids, we've tracked this the last few years, of those 500 kids, roughly half, every season, roughly half, do not attend church anywhere. Now, we've expanded our upward program from basketball to soccer and baseball and volleyball now, and we may be adding flag football coming uh, this season as well. That ministry has grown even so to the point that we take the funds that are generated from that ministry and use those to pay the salary full-time for our uh, man who directs, his name is Kyle, uh, for Kyle who directs all of our recreational uh, outreach ministries. He runs all of that now as a full-time member of our pastoral staff, funded by completely from those ministries themselves. Because parents will bring their kids to sports, they will pay for sports, they'll come onto a church campus for sports, and they'll feel uh, like it's a non-threatening environment, and it allows us to build a bridge into our community in that kind of way. You may not be in a community where that's right for you, but you may be. Uh, again, just look at what are we doing? Ask yourself the question. Take stock of what is the church doing to build bridges that connect the community to the church? 
We also have a child enrichment center that has a preschool and an after school, again, meets a need in the community, allows us to connect in a meaningful way. And then what about Sunday morning? You know, is it a safe place to bring lost people? Um, I only say that because I think uh, there is a there is a way in which we can preach on Sunday that um, ostracizes people who are far from God or do, do not know much about the faith. Um, versus even little simple things that we can do when we preach that will uh, just make it a little less threatening. Um, I'm not saying at all that we change the gospel by no means, or that we water down the message, or that we avoid uh, truth in the text that we're dealing with, or, or that we must preach topical sermons all the time, or anything like that. I'm saying no, I'm not saying any of that. Uh, but I am saying little things like one of the things that I uh, started doing is we put Bibles in the pews. And so in the back of every pew, there's a Bible. And so I will say when I tell our church where to turn, I will say if you're here today um, and you're new or you're here today and you didn't bring a Bible with you or you're not sure, you, maybe you did, but you're not sure how to find this uh, book and chapter, uh, there are Bibles in the back of the pew there in front of you. And I would encourage you to take one of those out and you'll find the passage on page you know, whatever, um, for today's text. Okay, so people know, like, hey, I can invite my lost neighbor, and they're not going to feel weird or looked at, or, you know, they're not going to stand out when they don't know how to find something, because he just assumed there are people here who don't know how to find it, and he told them how to get a Bible that will help them find it. That's a little thing that I do every single Sunday when I'm preaching that helps create a little bit of a safe feeling for our members to invite their friends. Another thing that I'll do periodically, or not periodically, but often in the sermon, you know, I'll say things like, uh, now for those of you that are here today and, and you really just don't know what this whole following Jesus thing is all about and who Jesus really is, you know, uh, for, for those of you, here's what I want to say to you. And, and again, just a little one minute thing like that helps. Or when you're, you're preaching and you know, you're you're uh, you're thinking about that that story in the Old Testament that's sort of vague and and obscure and and you know and you're going oh you guys remember back over there in the Old Testament when uh, David you know uh, could have killed Saul by uh, taking his sword and ramming it through his head when he snuck up on him in the middle of the night and you've got people in your church even that have grown up in church that aren't even familiar with that story. But if there are lost people there that are unfamiliar with the church at all, they're not familiar with these stories at all that makes them feel a little unusual. And so like they're, they don't know what they need to know to even show up here today. And so a lot of times uh, what I think is more healthy is when you're preaching is to simply, you know, uh, just assume that you assume that most of your people there aren't familiar with the story that you're referencing and give enough detail to make it, you know, make sense to those that wouldn't know as opposed to assuming that everybody does know, assume the opposite, that everybody doesn't know. And I think little things like that uh, help create an environment that's more conducive for even your own members to feel like, hey, I can invite. I can invite my family. I can invite my lost neighbors who've never been to church before. And, and they won't be ostracized uh, here. And then, again, it's just assuming that lost people are present. Now, I believe that we gather on the Lord's Day on Sunday for the edification of the saints primarily. But in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, um, in, when he's talking about tongues and the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, and we kind of get caught up in all that, but he says there, when you gather and out, if, if outsiders are present or when outsiders are present and you're gathering, you know, he says... Um, if all speak in tongues, will they not leave thinking you are mad? You're out of your mind. But if all prophesy, will they not leave concluding that God is truly present among you? Or will they not fall down on their face and worship this God? So the higher level principle in 1 Corinthians 14 points us to the reality that um, there is a way in which we can do our corporate gatherings on the Lord's Day that either push people further away from God, thinking that we're out of our minds, or move people by the genuineness of it, the understandability of it, to a point at which they would even become worshipers 
of God. So outreach, assess that. Um, evangelism, um, assess evangelism uh, in the church. Outreach is one thing, evangelism is another. I think I would, I always like to separate these two when I'm doing analysis of a church because sometimes we, um, we might be doing outreach but not evangelism. And if we don't think about them separately, uh, we'll, uh, we, we will basically, um, you know, live under the illusion that we're sharing the gospel when all we might be doing is just building bridges that create opportunities for the gospel, and we may not actually be sharing the gospel. So I like to separate the two. Uh, some questions. How many people are coming to faith in Christ at your church or through your church each year? Um, the average church, it takes 85 people to reach one. That's the national average is that for every 85 people in a church, one gets reached for the gospel in that church that year. Tom Rayner says that a healthier mark to strive for is 12 people being reached per 100. That's a better mark uh, to really strive for. Healthier churches that are healthy in evangelism, uh, they'll reach and see baptized on average about 12 per 100 uh, every year. We're slightly here at Lebanon below that mark. We are between 35 uh, to 45 uh, get baptized here in a given year. We run about 475, um, so you know we're we're closer to um, uh, you know a little closer there to uh, uh, below that number, but um, not not too far below it. Uh, and then, does the church pray regularly for lost people by name? Uh, do you have that in your church when the Sunday school classes or the life groups gather or when you meet for a midweek prayer uh, time with your church and prayer requests get shared? Do, do people share the names of lost people to, to pray for? Um, uh, do, do you hold each other accountable in your classes or life groups for personal witnessing? Um, there's an older gentleman in our church sits on the second row and his wife passed away a few years ago, and, and his neighbor down the street's wife passed away shortly after that. And he has been witnessing to his neighbor uh, for uh, for four years now. And at first, his neighbor was very hostile, very angry, uh, and, and just couldn't believe in God, and was going through a real difficult time with his wife passing, and grieving, and struggling, and taking medications, and couldn't sleep at night, and and um, the church member, uh, our church member was uh, sleeping easy, uh, confident that his wife was in heaven and that he'd see her again one day. And he's been witnessing to him and he shares it regularly uh, and telling those kinds of stories to your people from the pulpit um, and, and just sharing those in our classes, holding each other accountable can really help. Uh, and then what about training? Uh, because one of the reasons, the top reasons that Christians give for not sharing their faith is that they're just, they're unequipped with how to do it, that they're fearful and unaware of how exactly to do it. So do you as a church offer any kind of regular training in evangelism? I would argue that if we're not training people in evangelism ongoing, consistently, once a year, at least, that there's some kind of training opportunity for evangelism for our people to go through. Uh, then we're probably not focusing on it, and it's probably not happening uh, to the degree that it should be. And then assimilation. Does the church attract and retain guests? Is there a process for identifying guests and helping connect them to the church? Is it clear to guests what their next steps should be to get involved, plugged in, become a member, get further involved? For us, we use the Discover class for that. So as people are coming, we're saying, if you're new here, you're a guest here today, we'd love you to fill out the Connect card. If you didn't already do that on the way in, we have a big table right there in our lobby uh, that guests have to basically go around because there's a big A-frame sign that says, um, new here, stop here, or new today, stop here, or guest, stop here. You know, just some sign like that big. And they have to kind of go around at most stop and fill out the card, and then we can connect with them afterwards, and that sort of begins our assimilation process uh, for them. And then we're saying, hey, if you've been coming for a little bit, you've come a few weeks, sign up for our Discover class. That's how you figure out what it means to be a member 
uh, a covenant member here of Lebanon Baptist Church. And so that's something we teach about four times a year. And I offer that and we encourage them to sign up and register. But most of the guests that come will not sign up for those classes uh, if we just make an announcement about it or if we send out a generic email about it. They sign up when they are personally contacted, either a text message personally from me or one of our other pastors uh, or a specific uh, personal email sent to them asking them to sign up. Uh, does the church website uh, help guests? Uh, what does it look like uh, in your church to fully assimilate guests in your church? The question I ask here is, do we have any kind of strategy that helps move people from the community or coming to some outreach event helps move them from that to fully functioning member of your church. And, and, you know, I would describe here, as we describe a fully functioning member, we would describe that as someone who has taken the step of membership. Uh, of course, they've been saved, baptized. They've taken the step of church membership. They're, they are active in a life group. They are actively serving in at least one ministry, and they are giving generously, sacrificially, and faithful. Um, okay, that is sort of a fully functioning member uh, for us. What is your process? Uh, and then community analysis. I, I, the question I would ask here is, do you, know, do you know your community? Do you know who your community is? What's the socioeconomic makeup of the community immediately surrounding the church? How well does the church look like the community? Does the church have healthy community partnerships? There's a great resource through NAM uh, that allows you to um, go in there and you can just put in some information and data based on your church address and they will do a full demographic study for you and send you the PDF, 45 pages or so, telling you all about the community makeup uh, of your uh, of your neighborhood, of your community surrounding your church. It's an invaluable resource to have and to study. Uh, I actually, I will make uh, a link available for that that I'll send out so you'll have it if you've never done that before. And then they'll even for free, uh, Josh Dreyer uh, down in Key West, um, I've met with several times and we've discussed these issues and he's helped me look at uh, different churches and kind of analyze their community and do the same thing for our church. And um, he will even schedule a Zoom meeting with you if you'd like to do that. And he'll walk you through explaining all the data. But there's uh, different ways you can do it. You can basically have them run a diff demographic report based on either like a one mile, three mile, five mile, 10 mile kind of radius. You can choose different radius uh, around the church or you can choose drive time and you can give different drive times, three, five, 10, 15. You can put in different drive times and do it that way. I think the drive time is probably a little bit better and more helpful. Um, but, you know, even our community is a little bit unique here because we are a suburb. And so because we're a suburban community, uh, people uh, and, and, and for us, we are located to the north and a bit east to the north and a bit east of downtown. And so because of that, uh, people to our south, people that live south and west of us more in the city are less likely to dra travel out to where we are for church. So our community is a lot closer to us if we're heading south and west from the church, but our community stretches out a lot further when you go north and east uh, and west, you know, just in that direction, because it gets a little further spread out and they'll travel more towards us uh, because uh, it just becomes a little more uh, rural out in that way. So again, for us, it's not as simple to say our community is just a, a three-mile or a five-mile radius. Um, we have to kind of uh, almost mushroom-like uh, draw that uh, for us. But what does your community look like? If your community is ethnically diverse, does the church reflect that? You know, that's kind of been a, uh, a talking point and popular uh, for churches to say we're striving for ethnic diversity um, I don't think every church should be ethnically diverse, um, and, and I say that just because I'm saying if you're in a community that is, you know, not ethnically diverse, if you're in a community that is one ethnicity, then you, you're not, re there's nobody for you to reach that would be uh, of a different ethnic makeup 
so, but if you're in a community that is diverse, then I think um, you you know the church should be striving uh, for that to reflect the community. Uh, for us, we're making some significant strides in that area because our community is diverse. Uh, you can look at the bleachers on Saturday morning, and you can see the ethnic diversity in the bleachers. And then on Sunday morning, it's not quite like that. It's much closer to that now than it was seven years ago. But it's not it's not as diverse as Saturday morning basketball is uh, right here in our in our gym. But we've made significant moves towards that because we identified that hey, we don't quite reflect the diversity in our community, but we understand it's there. We see it when you go over to Food Line right across the street from the church and you go shopping in there, you'll see the ethnic makeup and the diversity within our community and the split, but you won't see that exactly reflected in the church closer, but not exactly yet. See, but just analyzing these things as a pastor, as a leader, looking at this, do you know who your community is? What do you know about your community? What kind of community is it? So, I would encourage you to make sure you do some demographic community analysis. Uh, And then prayer. Does the church have a robust prayer ministry? Uh, What does the prayer ministry of the church look like? How well do the staff pray together? Does the pastor pray and spend consistent time weekly pleading with God over the health of the church? Uh, I heard of a pastor that uh, was very very much used by God in an instrumental way to lead his church to health and growth. And I remember talking to him, and one of the things that he mentioned to me Uh, was that for a long period of time, every week, there was one day of the week that he skipped his lunch and he prayed and he fasted for the church, interceding and praying that God would do a work in their church. And uh, I believe that the health and growth of that church was directly tied to that pastor's pleading with the Lord in prayer uh, over the health of the church. And then what what kind of prayer requests dominate the time? You know, most of our prayer services um, have been described as organ recitals, you know, where we're praying for uh, Brother Bill's uh, kidney or uh, Sister Sue's uh, liver. You know, they're praying for health issues, uh, which are not bad. We should be praying for that. God cares about those things. They matter to us. They matter to God. But are we really praying for a spiritual move of God? That that, that will tell you about uh, an area uh, in the church that might be in need of uh, some repair. Look at the prayer ministry of the church. Again, all I'm saying at this point to you is assess, take stock of and assess the health or lack thereof in any given one of these areas in your church, really looking at all of them and, and assessing. You could take all of these categories and these questions and lay them out on a sheet of paper, kind of in a grid form, and you you score the church you know, on a scale of one to 10 or giving it a letter grade A to F, having your leadership do that. How do we think we are uh, as a church in this area in prayer? If we're asking some of these good questions, would we score ourselves at an A or B or C or a D? And then taking the conglomerate of what your deacons or your pastors or, or your Sunday school teachers or some, some representative group within the church taking a conglomerate of their answers and their grading of these, putting it all together and averaging it out and saying, okay, well, we see which areas we're really unhealthy in. And maybe we begin to focus on some of those. We're, we're going to spend a whole, a whole week looking at prayer and preaching because I don't think there's any, t- any more uh, important, instrumental, any more important areas that correlate to growth and health in a church than prayer and preaching, those two uh, in specific. So we'll spend the whole week on those. But with preaching, and I'll kind of close, I think, yeah, I'll sort of close, I'll close with this one today with preaching. What, what For this lecture, what does the main weekly platform for speaking into the life of the members in the church look like? What types of messages are being preached? Are they biblically sound? You know, I remember when I, at the church where I'm at now, there is a long history here of uh, lack of biblical depth in preaching. Uh, The church was described to me when I was considering coming here as being a mile wide, but an inch deep. And it had been that way over uh, the past, you know, three pastors. One, the the, the last of, the first of which uh, had, had been a pastor here for 30, over 30 years. 
and uh, then the next two that followed him. Uh, so for the last 45 years, for the previous 45 years, the preaching from the pulpit had not been uh, what you would uh, deem strong, solid meat of the word. And so I remember early on in uh, in the ministry here, I remember like, you know, I've been here a few months and I got up to preach and I said, everybody take your Bibles and turn to, um, and it was very quiet. You, you couldn't hear very many pages. Like you just could not hear pages turn. And I looked, I kind of remember looking out and most people were just looking at me. They weren't, they weren't opening their Bibles. They weren't bringing their Bibles. Well, a couple of years ago, after four or five years of being here, uh, I remember saying, take your Bibles and turn to, and it just kind of hit me. You know, I could hear the pages turning and I could see the majority of the people were looking down, trying to find the place in their Bibles. And it just kind of hit me like, wow, what a difference four or five years has made with good, solid, you know, focused on the text preaching. Um, and, you know, are the, are the, is there appropriate time given to application during the message, even in your preparation and delivery? Or is the application sort of an afterthought? You know, does the sermon leave the members wondering what difference does that make? You know, even if we preach Scripture and we preach messages that are rooted and grounded in the text of Scripture, that leave people, you know, looking at it, bringing their Bibles, looking into it, going, wow, that is cool, that is great, oh, and, they, and they're engaging with Scripture. Even if our preaching and teaching is biblically strong and sound, do we take that extra step of making sure that we're doing the work of helping them to apply it, to know practically how does this, how does this translate into my life or how does this translate into the life of our church? You know, that's super important, super important. A good question to ask yourself is, after preaching this sermon and I've given everything that I've prepared to the people, can they walk out of here today with the thought, you know, that was really cool, really interesting. I'd never heard some of that before, but what difference does that really make? Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And if if your sermon leaves them wondering what difference it makes or what am I supposed to do with it, then you haven't given adequate time, either in your delivery or most likely in your preparation. You haven't given a, a, appropriate, adequate time to to application. And that's important, too. Um, yeah, I just, preaching is so, uh, key, uh, to the, the life and the health of the church. Um, one of the pastor's most important responsibilities, if not his most important responsibility, um, in terms of the tasks of the ministry would be the preaching. And I want to say this too, I think there is a direct correlation to uh, preaching and revitalization from the standpoint of preaching that speaks to how this applies to the church, to the life of our church right now with what we're going through or what we're doing. A lot of times I feel like in churches, the preaching can be very good, uh, solid biblical preaching and very practical and very applicable individually for people, but doesn't speak to the life of the church as a whole at the moment. There is a way in which, and by the way, you're starting to see some, I'm seeing some some writing blogs and articles and even books now, just now start to come out that focus on preaching for revitalization. You know, when, when you're trying to lead a church to be revitalized, the preaching is, is the optimal opportunity for you to be able to speak into from the scripture the needs of the church, like if there is a real weakness in the church in terms of evangelism, the preaching needs to address that. And maybe you want to do a topic on that or you want to weave that in consistently. Or if you're getting ready to, uh, you know, maybe you're looking at the financial health of the church and you're seeing that this is something that needs to be emphasized. Is the preaching speaking to that for the life of the church? There is a way in which 
a lot of times our preaching can be can even be applicable individually for people and relevant practically for people in that way. But we can go on week by week by week by week consistently, never really addressing how it applies to the church right now where we are situated and in the season that we are in. And I, I think that's something that you have to look at and take analysis of. All right. We've got several other areas to look at, but we will deal with those um, uh, in uh, in week two. All right. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for watching lecture one uh, in our course. Uh, principles and strategies uh, for church revitalization.